Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Crash Moto GP podcast. On the show today, all the reaction from Thailand after an intense few weeks in Moto GP with action both on the track and off of it. And it's the off track antics that are really making the headlines today. The recording date is Wednesday, the 5th of October. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash's Moto GP editor, Pete McLaren, and former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewen. But before everything, we would like to say that our thoughts are with British superbike racer Chrissy Rouse, who I'm sure you've all seen and heard crashed heavily uh, last weekend at the BSB race at Donington Park. Keith, it's never nice to see or hear about these things, but absolutely all of our thoughts are with Chrissy at this time. Yeah, I mean, fellow podcaster as well as a racer and all-round good egg. I mean, he's, he's one of those kids that, that, you know, you can only see the amount of fallout there's been around the paddock, just how respected he and his family are. Um, I mean, I hesitate to say these things happen, but but when they happen to someone like Rousey, then, then everybody is right behind him. I mean, it's a good thing, actually, we're recording this on Wednesday because there's so much news that's come out of the woodwork over the last Monday, Tuesday, that uh, Wednesday's a good day to be recording it. Unfortunately... I haven't heard anything more positive about Chrissy. Um, we're just wishing him well as he's got a, a bit of a hill to climb. Um, I mean, any funding or any help that anybody can give certainly would be appreciated by by his family, that's for sure, in that longer road to recovery. Um, I have to say that, again, the MSVR, the, the Race Safe Marshals Association and the like, they did such a good job and were so quick on the case of that, the best possible help that Chrissy could have had as quick as he could have had it. I mean, it would not have been any better anywhere else in the world. So hopefully that early intervention, that, that you know, swift of foot that those marshals and, and race direction got to Chrissy, that that will have been a benefit to him and will have helped him in his, his recovery, that's for sure. But um, never a nice thing. And the whole paddock is, is, is bleeding for him at the moment. Absolutely. Well, uh, the latest uh, we're hearing as well, he's transferred to hospital, underwent surgery on the 3rd of October uh, and remains fully sedated in a serious condition in the intensive care unit um, and crashed on it. And our sister site, Visor Down as well, will have any developments on Chrissy's uh, condition uh, when there's anything to report. But we keep Chrissy absolutely uh, in our thoughts. Um, now, let's uh, get on with the rest of the show in, in true podcast fashion. And apologies for the uh, slightly late release of uh, this week's show i was on holiday but uh always it's worth the wait for keith ewan's thoughts and opinions i'm sure uh before we rewind properly to some of the racing action we saw last weekend now it as i alluded to at the start it's the off track antics that are making the headlines and reading it all whether it's um the behavior of some teams in the moto gp paddock or whether it's perhaps moto 3 and the incidents between mechanics engineers and riders that have made the headlines the last couple of weekends toxic behavior toxic atmospheres seem to really be brewing inside the paddock at the moment in amongst the teams is this something that? can be put down Keith to a one-off I'm of course referring to the Moto3 incident at first with uh, Max Biaggi's team and the Adrian Fernandez incident but of course right at the start of this uh, this morning the uh, statement released by Dorna about the Tom Booth Amos incident as well that has only just surfaced after video footage of him being basically assaulted by a mechanic uh, in the team from 2019 can we put these down to one-offs or is this something that Actually, we really got to start clamping down on and thinking, is there an inherent issue somewhere here? Well, of course, we've got to clamp down on it. But let's get to first things first. I mean, this bit of video has been around for a long time. It wasn't released um, at all. In fact, it's it's somebody kind of, you know, it is with anything to do with, with social media and the like. You pass it on to a friend of yours and your friend passes it on to that friend and that friend passes it on to another friend. And by the time it gets diluted to the um, friend of the friend of the friend, um, they don't think it's that important or that much of a worry. So they put it out there and make a, a quippy comment about it, which is basically where it came from. Steve Brogan um, let loose the, the, the whirlwind that is. Um, I, I, I mean, Tom Booth Amos, I mean, I like Tom Booth Amos. I, you know, he's a, he's a good kid, basically. First surprise to me was that he didn't pick up the biggest, heaviest thing he could have found and brain the bloke for, for whacking. I mean, you didn't see it, but he was getting kicked on the floor, you know, at the back of the garage by this, this technician, I'll call him for wanting something better. Um, you know, it was a serious, serious incident. But what you've got to remember is, is that 
you know, probably the reason why Tom didn't react, everyone says, well, why didn't that footage go away? Why wasn't, you know, this guy bought the book straight away? Well, the point being is, is that Dorna were funding Tom at the time to, to, to produce him, you know, a decent team ride. He was concerned for his career that year. That was in Thailand, of course, going back. So it was an anniversary of Thailand uh, when the incident happened. So that was 2019. So that's why we've not really, really heard much about it, because it was that kind of anniversary. And the, the fact is, is that he would have been worried. And, and I think all racers, including myself, have been in a position where we wished we'd reacted in a, in a, a different way months on years on or something regarding a team we were with when we were being abused or treated badly by that team but the fact is you grit your teeth and you get on with it you know this guy this guy had had verbally abused tom on a few occasions you know once i'm told in front of his parents you know it's a situation where the guy obviously was a bit of a loose cannon um and and as it moves on he is now crew chief or was his crew chief for john mcphee over in max biaggi's team now He's been fired this morning. We've seen a, a, a notification this morning. That's why I said earlier on, Wednesday's a good day, day this week. So glad for your holiday because we've got even more information. He's going to be fired out of um, McPhee's team as well. You know, but if you consider that it was McPhee's team who, who created a problem for Fernandez just a few weeks ago and, and tried to, to halt him from going out to slipstream one of their, their, their men, um, there is obviously that toxicity that you were talking about, and he's obviously at the head of it. I mean, Max Biaggi is going to be using his own spanners fairly soon because that's three of his team that have been fired. Um, although, and people follow up on it, I don't think it's an immediate dismissal. I think that everyone's a bit concerned that, that Max may have to get the spanners out and work for himself. The wider issue is the toxicity within you know, the paddock. No, I don't think that's a, a normal situation. I think it's a hot-headed, emotional, you know, vibrant environment where everybody is working to the to on adrenaline quite often i can see it getting worse as we take on more and more grand prix and team members are away from home for longer and longer and longer and in each other's faces for longer and longer and longer it's rare that you work in a team where there isn't inter-team aggravation you know a rider a rider sometimes is rude you know like he is he's on the edge all the time wants the best thousandths of a second out of the bike Somebody's dropped the ball slightly in the rest of the team. Do you forgive them? Of course you do in the cold, hard light of day, but not at that moment. You, you let go with a bit of verbal. You give them the eyeball, whatever it is. You're not happy. Tom came back in. Something was wrong with the bike. He gave it a bit of mouth. And this guy, instead of doing what he should have done as a, as a crew chief technician, you know, taking it on the nose for the minute and then getting Tom around the back of the trucks and saying, look, don't speak to me like that, my old mate. We're all working together and we're trying to make this move forward. He didn't. He started smacking the back of Tom, punching him, kicking him. It was horrendous, outrageous. If you've seen it outside a nightclub in Northampton down the road from here with everybody slugging it out in the street when they're stoned, you know, you, you, they'd get done and slung in jail. I think it broadens out as well. So there's a wider situation here. And I think there was, dare I say it, the, the fiancé to, to, to a man that I perhaps am a bit hard on sometimes, uh, Maddie Scodia has put a very, very good piece out there asking really about how, when there's a problem in the paddock, one, a serious issue like this, like misogyny, if you like, like the other things that, that she quite likes to, to get on top of and try to lift up the lid on all of these things that, that may or may not be an issue in the paddock. That's for other people. I'm not in the paddock nowadays, so it's for other people to look at now as well. But we should all think and look for these things and find a way of dealing with it. I think Dorna again find themselves in a position, hang on a second, you know, is this our problem? Um, it's an assault. It should be the local police that are dealing with it. No, it's Dorna's problem. Dorna must deal with this, must have a process for dealing with this. If somebody in a working environment is abused in any way, you know, against the law of the land, wherever you are, or against their constitution or their policies, Dorna's policies, regarding teams through ERTA, the International Race Teams Association, it must be dealt with. There must be a mechanism for, for dealing with that. And I think we're seeing more, you know, I don't want to join the woke karate. I really, really don't. I mean, I think that the situation that we need to be in is what is right and reasonable within our working environment. You know, kicking the backside of your rider isn't okay. You know, violence isn't okay in a working environment environment you know for sure people are going to get a bit mouthy it's going to get 
you know, we've seen handbags many, many, many times. It's, you know, you're going to get that. We're in a hot head environment. This is a, a motorcycle racing environment. But when it moves on the extra stage to violence or abuse of any kind, whatever it might be, if it's abusive and it's a continual campaign of abuse. And this guy sounds like he has he has a, a problem. He has a social problem. He has a he's crew chief to, to John McPhee. You know, we had two of their two of two of the guys that worked with him. It wasn't him, I understand, that, that got involved in the Fernandez thing. But as crew chief to John McPhee, was it him who instructed his two other uh, mechanics to go and block Fernandez on his way out of pit lane? We don't know. Someone's going to be getting to the bottom of that. It won't matter anyway because they're all getting fired. The three of them now are all, all on their way. Strangely, not immediately. That's probably to save Biaggi from having to get the Spanners out himself. But I want to know. And everybody wants to know. And again, if you haven't read the Maddie, Maddie Scordia, Scordia piece, excuse me if I haven't pronounced her name properly. I've had nothing to do with Maddie. I don't know her at all personally. Um, she's the fiance of Simon Patterson, who we do talk about occasionally. Um, and the fact is that her journalism, she has done what I always say a journalist should do. She's asked the question and is looking for the answer. Whereas some journalists give you their opinion and quite often a wide of the mark. I think you ask the question of the expert in the circumstances and what she's done is she's asked the question, well, where do I go if I'm a, if I'm a woman that's being, you know, insulted or, or not treated correctly within, where do I go? You know, could you go as a, I think one of her questions was if you were a, a promotional girl, for instance, and you were, you know, mishandled in some way, shape or form, who do I complain to? Complaining to the team is going to be very difficult. Complaining to the police is going to be seem seem a way over the top situation at the time, but there is no one else you can complain to. So you've either got to escalate it to an out of proportion situation, or you've got to ignore it. And I think if you if there's any abuse, you you shouldn't ignore it. And I think we're all a bit responsible in this situation as well. I mean, I I'm probably one of the yeah. You know, what you got to remember is my life has been through so many stages of. Uh, ev evolution, if you like, in attitude towards different things from 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 my early age. I mean, blimey, we used to collect tokens on the side of raspberry jam to save them up. And those of you that are as old as me will remember what they are. Completely taboo now. The very subject, I don't even mention the what you know the name of the 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 collection. Um, and evolution, and it's correct. The, the, I think what what happens in these things is if you take a median. I think sometimes it, the woke or arty go too far. I think, but the median is is what is respectful and correct in our society as it is at the moment. And I think what's happened in the paddock is it's slightly the wrong side of that median. I think we're we're, we're still we've got work to do in the paddock. And I think that people are right to bring it to attention, but the problem is when it gets too far towards the woke or arty, we end up with a situation where people go. I'm going to ignore that just because it's bloody annoying me that people keep banging on about, I've got to tick this box, I've got to tick that box, I've got to say, I can't say this, I can't say that. You know, I, I got to, to work with somebody recently, not recently now, um, two or three years ago, where they were pumping out these courses that you had to go on, diversity, inclusion, uh, unconscious bias, uh, so on and so forth. And I got to the, I came home, bearing in mind my house is like the United Nations around here. We've got every nationality you could possibly have that either live with us or, or, or a part of us here. And suddenly I got to a situation where I can't call my kids mixed race. It's now dual heritage. Total bollocks. You know, my, everybody here knows exactly where they are in, 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 in life. I never notice colour in my entire life. I never have until now. Now that it has become such a major issue, and this, this again comes down to all the other categories of abuse, of recognition, and I think it's a good thing that we all recognise all these categories and all these different things, because that is, as a human being, that's what we should all aspire to. We should understand um, about every other category of person, of, of situation, whatever it might be. Um, so that's the far edge of all of this. But where we are at the moment, with the violence in, in the paddock, this guy should have been prosecuted, in my view. He was a professional within that paddock. He should not have been let off. You know, punching, kicking a man while he's on the floor um, within the same team. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine? 
If you did that with any of your employees, if I did that with anybody that works for me, I got cheesed off for them enough. They gave me enough lip for me to lay into them. Where would that have gone? Yeah, it's 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 crazy. It can't be it can't be any different in a paddock than it is in a normal life in a normal working environment. And I think that that's again where I respect Maddie Scordia's um, you know uh, article on it. I can't remember which web, website or, or whatever it is, but it's out there. And if you follow Maddie on on Twitter, you can find her on there. It's a well written piece, and um, and it and it and it it just triggers those things. It, it she's very, it's been very clever because what she's triggered is uh, you've suddenly gone you've gone. Huh. And you've thought about it. And I think that's what good journalism does. It makes you think about it. It makes you wonder, where am I in this? Where, where, where is my thinking in this? Am I, am I correct in the way I'm thinking? And I think that's where good journalism really, really works. And to be frank with you, we are missing good journalism since social media. So good on her. It's fascinating, isn't it? And, and you're right. It, it is making more and more people think and and it's not been uh, well certainly the the max biagi team incidents are not being swept under the rug they've been swiftly dealt with but the video you know took a while to, to even appear in the first place it makes you think well what else is going on Pete? and, and equally though h- how do you do do we just you know do we just move on from this hmm. that's the, the the biggest question isn't it? the first one is why did it take this long to come out but you know what you can't blame the victim here, Tom. But as Keith says, why didn't he he have anywhere to go that he could say, "Look, this just happened to me in the pits." Uh, you know, there's, there, is there is there no procedure in place for this kind of thing? Now, rewind to 2019 in Thailand. Now, this was the event where Mark Marquez came in with a chance of winning the title, had that massive high side, went off to hospital, came back, ended up riding, won the race, won the world championship. Now, all I mean by that is there was a lot going on at that event. And so when you have, you know, something big happening over here, perhaps it's easier for something to be hidden over here. And I hadn't heard anything about this until the video came out. And I think that's the same for most people that were in the media room. We didn't hear anything about it. There was no whisper. Normally there's a whisper of something, but there wasn't this. As soon as it popped up on social media, everybody was as shocked, you know, whether you're in the paddock or not. It just nobody knew about it. And that's the but that's the problem, isn't it? We should have known. Everybody should have known. It shouldn't have been kind of hidden away for that long. And, uh, you know, Biaggi's team, to be honest, you've got to feel a bit sorry for them because this occurred, you know, they had no knowledge of this either. This statement that came out today says that the team, you know, they didn't know about this. Well, and now it happened you know, in it's, the it's, pit it's, box. Surely but, there was yeah. knowledge of it. But what you've got to remember is it was a private video. It was a private, you know, the guy who took it was shooting, you know, Tom coming in. It was a mate of his. And it wasn't for general consumption he'd, he'd got it tom didn't want to cause a, a, a big furore at the time that to be honest i mean tom was in a difficult position a taking a taking a beating off of his one of his mechanics and b he didn't know how to handle it you know he was in fear of not being able to come back into that paddock what you got to remember is is innuendo is something that's massive in a workplace in a work environment when you've got somebody who says something over here about you um, and it slowly but surely trickles over somewhere else, and it's had that modification of, of content in that journey. You know, Tom Booth Amos could not afford his, his performances at the time, for whatever reason, whether it be bike mechanic, rider, whatever it was, were not yet good enough for him to be assured of a place in that paddock. One or two more things, like somebody saying, well, yeah, but he's a complete sod to work with. We don't, you know, he does this, he does that. We don't like him. You know, that crew chief has been in that paddock longer than Tom had. So therefore, he will have a bigger, wider circle of people that either respect him or are friends with him. So therefore, he could spread rumours about Tom that could put Tom out of a job. And at the end of the day, you don't get too many opportunities to be in a Grand Prix paddock. It is a very, very, very cutthroat environment. So I, I absolutely understand where Tom was coming from. Again, in a, in a you know... <laughs> It's not all about me, but I'll talk about me anyway. Um, the, the fact was that back in the day when I had a, a new RS500 Honda in this country, in Great Britain, came from Honda Britain, you know, it was such a pile of junk. Two of us had them, a fella called Chris Guy and me, and we just had such an awful time with those motorbikes. They, they were massively expensive to run, but we didn't feel we could make a complaint about it. We didn't feel we could get Honda on side to look after us. Chris Guy came to me because it very nearly finished, well, it finished his racing career, but it nearly finished him financially as well. 
he asked me to join him in a, in a lawsuit against Honda over it. And I was scared. That's the, an admission that I've never made before about anything in my life. I was actually scared to do it because I thought it would finish my career in motorbike racing. So you can go back to the early 1980s and, and basically the same thing applied back then. There was no mechanism for me to be able to take Honda on at that particular time. And I was worried about my future in motorbikes as it happened. It didn't last much longer after that anyway. So such is life. But the point being is, is that as a motorbike racer and his management as well, I mean, I don't know what Tom had in the way of management. I doubt he had much in the way of management looking after him who could have actually sorted that problem out. I mean, a lot of top line riders have got managers who are in the system so they can, they can deal with any of that kind of stuff and take it to a higher level without it being public. They can deal with it behind the curtain. Um, but I think when it's got to the stage where you've got this kind of violence and then, um, then basically, you know, that's, that's very nearly criminal. Well, it is criminal, but you know where I'm going. Or maybe not. Well, no, I, I, well, heavy words it's criminal but um it clearly that's uh something that well dawna have been dealing with it they put this statement out this morning as we record on, on wednesday the 5th of october but uh clearly um trouble brewing or trouble certainly having to be dealt with as the consequence of max biagi see but the other thing that's uh, that's come out recently which i know you were quite vocal on uh twitter about keith um and uh, we've spoken about it uh before matt oxley and uh, his uh, article on his his treatment by the ducati factory pr team and uh, bringing in um politics uh into motorsport is always such a, a big thing isn't it can, do they have to be together can we separate them but at the end of the day i think you've alluded to journalists are there to to do their job and sometimes that is to ask hard questions what did you make on uh, the ducati gate situation well it's gonna be interesting to get pete's take on this as well because i respect pete as a journalist as well matt oxley for me is top end matt oxley is challenging He's awkward sometimes, but basically he is a motorcycle man. He is he could have gone off and done something else ages ago, but but he's still in the paddock as long as I've been in the paddock. You know, Oxley, you know, whether you like his politics or not, yeah, you, you still have to he's one of those annoying people where even if you don't like his politics, um, you still will follow Matt Oxley because what he says about motorbike racing is well thought out, well researched. And it's that old school of verifiable sources, isn't it? Um, we were talking earlier on before we came on air about whether we could say certain things, but because those certain things are out there now and we've spoken to our sources, they've been verified independently. Twitter and the like is, is an unverifiable source most of the time. Somebody just puts out speculation and may or may not be right. And, and, and some 50% of people might believe what they've just read and 50% might dismiss it social media is a very it's a minefield it's a very difficult place to be as a journalist but matt oxley is one of those people in the paddock and he's basically taken on ducati you know this weekend he is he's gone for him um and, I, and i've got to say he's got a bit of lead in his pencil as, as matt oxley for doing that but he's going to have a massive force of media behind him because it's the responsibility of a pr it's public relations that's what pr bloody stands for so these guys trying to exclude Matt Oxley because he said something that they don't like is ridiculous. It's ridiculous, childish and unnecessary. Ducati need to slap their PR department and sort it out because basically at the end of the day, you know, Matt Oxley is doing his job and I don't think there's anybody will, that's out there will, that will say he's doing a bad job. I think he's doing a fantastic job. He's bringing into the public domain stuff that he should be bringing into the public domain it is his job to do it you know and he can't be castigated for something that he's written or said and by the way everything he's written or said is accurate you know it's not like he's, he's it's not like he said something that is completely wide of the mark and therefore ducati is saying well until you get your acting on together we're not allowing you to to access to this that and the other i, I think the PR person's job is to manage the media, is to manage to try and enhance the, the stuff they want to get out there, is to talk with the media, to try and move them on side, to try and feed them with the information that the, the media need. Now, if there's something that's that's dark and, and in the background that, that somebody's managed to get hold of that's out there, I think what it is, it all, it all goes back to tire gate, doesn't it? The tire pressure thing. Matt Oxley got hold of a sheet that basically said that a lot of tire pressures in MotoGP 
were not where they should be because the software that they'd got at the time for monitoring these things, it will all change in 2023, but, but for monitoring tire pressures was not yet accurate enough to, uh, to monitor in the way that they need to monitor. Moto3 and Moto2 are, but MotoGP are, are not yet, the standardized system across all of the, the manufacturers is not actually in place yet. So what happens is, is you've got a sheet that goes out and everybody's got their tire pressures on it. And, and it shows that some of the tires and, and Ducati as well, were running lower tire pressures than they should do from a, from a, a recommendation point of view. And it can only be a recommendation at the moment because they don't have the software to actually measure it in the way that they should have. Um, and so Matt's story was, for me, it was a non-story. When it came out, I remember thinking, well, what's all the big fuss about? We all know what's going on. It's, it's not yet. The, the, uh, Erta and the technical teams are not yet in a position where they can measure accurately across every manufacturer tire pressures to a point where they can legislate um, within the rules. They will be in 2023. There will be a system in place where, where the, all of that is, is spot on. So what Matt had found was, was this sort of voluntary um, system that was in place for all the teams at the time with a sheet of, of tire pressures and stuff on it. And of course, it all blew up and everybody went mad about it and said, oh, they're cheating, they're cheating. But no, it's, it's not a case of that at all at the time. Um, but I think that the the problem was Ducati took exception to that and the PR department basically started this sort of underhand campaign to uh, exclude Mr. Oxley from, from one or two things. And, uh, and that's compounded in recent, recent weeks. Um, I still think it's the responsibility of the PR team to get control of, of, of the media and put out what they expect to be put out and deal with whatever the media has found that isn't quite consistent. And that's the media's job. I mean, I hate the thought that, that, you know, like people like Pete wandering around the paddock, <laughs> he's effectively not allowed to say anything that's detrimental to a team. <laughs> well, from a fan's point of view, and that's exactly where I am at the moment, and I know you are, Harry. I mean, we want to know that stuff. The whole reason we're having this babble on, on Crash.net is because people want to hear what is out there that they've not heard before. And that's the job of a journalist in within the paddock. Pete, have you been banned yet? Well, you don't know either. This is the other thing, isn't it? That, that, I mean, you request interviews. Now, you might not get them. Now, does that mean that you are on blacklist? We always hear that teams have certain blacklists. You don't know. I mean, they, they're not going to tell you. I mean, that's the other thing. So, um, but Matt is obviously, you know, he's put two and two together from from all of the interview requests he's put in and, and not getting any any uh, acceptance of those, those requests. So, yeah, I mean, it's always a complicated issue, isn't it, between the media and the PR people because... We've obviously got completely different interests, as, as Keith has just explained there. But, you, you know, you've got to, again, as Keith said, is you've got to not take it personally, have you? It's the job. It's our job and it's their job. They're going to fight for their team and we're going to, you know, say what we think is actually happening. And, uh, you know, you have to you have to have respect on both sides and, uh, you know, but not talking to people should should never be an option, should it? I, you know, I love the merry dance. I mean, I love it. I mean, when I was in television, you know, not so much with BT because it wasn't really my job to be out there, but he, you know, firing these things in. But when back in the day, when it was my job to interview people, I loved it. I absolutely loved getting. And as soon as you see that little look of fear in the other person's eyes, you think, ha oh. <laughs> let's tear, let's tear that sheet of paper back and we'll, we'll really get stuck into it. And that, that I find is missing on some TV channels as well now. They seem to have homogenized it all down a little bit. You know, it's not quite the controversial uh, questions being asked or, 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 or the like in commentary as well in, in some respects. It's all a bit too nicey now. And, and I, I think it's lost a little edge. On, you know, TV has lost a little edge on, on those kind of things. Um, again, I suppose when you week on, week out, you know, the PR person... Just to, to reiterate the process, in the old days, you know, well, no, let's, let's go back to my time in, in commentary in, in MotoGP. I'd get into the car park in the morning early because everybody who's anybody has got to park their car and walk to their garage. So you got if you were a journalist, you know, you could tell the proper guys they were all there early because you could walk in with somebody, you know, that – 100-yard walk through the, the beeper gate and all the rest of it to the garage with Jerry Burgess, I'll use as an example because he's not in the paddock anymore, so I'm not going to be hanging anybody out to dry. That walk in with Jerry Burgess in the morning gave you more information than you had the rest of the weekend. You know, it's so so that, pulling up in the car park, and there, and there are there are quite a few people that do it. You know, you, David Emmett's of the world, who, again, is another one 
but can annoy the hell out of you with what he says sometimes politically. But but you know you're still reading his stuff, you're still listening to what he says because he does the work. You know, at the end of the day, you might not even like the person that's putting the work out there, but you're still there. Gunter Wiesinger. Gunter Wiesinger has been around since my day. You know, and then the fact is the guy still gets a scoop. Half the journalists in the paddock just, you know, plagiarise stuff that Gunter's put out on, on his website. You know, it, it's a it's a fantastic environment. I, I mean, I really, really enjoy it. But I, I think that trying to beat the media down, all right, widen it right out into the general media. I mean, yeah, stories broken in tabloid press and the like. You might not like the way it's written. You might not like the, 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 the direction it's going in. But the fact of the matter is they've broken a story. You know, it's. I think sometimes that's exciting. It's, it's, you know, and from a from a normal person's point of view, you want that insight. You want that stuff that's behind the scenes. You want to know about all the the poo that's going on. You know, who's causing trouble and who's where and what. And that's good journalism is about that. I think it's not about a journo's opinion really. I mean, they can put that in there if they like, but but you know, then I think it's gone the wrong way. But I think good sharp journalism. And again, Oxley, if we keep talking about Oxley, I mean, he's been there 40 odd years in that paddock. I've known him all that time. And his stuff is sharp and it's verified. And you, you know, when you, you might not like it, but you can trust it is, is well researched. And I think that that's, I hope we don't lose that. I genuinely hope we don't lose that. I will just say sort of around what, 2005, 2006, when I was just sort of first getting to the tracks at MotoGP, as the web media, you know, we were treated as the exiles because of course the print media who were going to publish in a week's time, they hated having us at the track. They wanted to do everything they could to exclude us from uh, speaking to the riders, the teams and everything else. And Matt Oxley was one of the few guys who didn't do any of that. He would always say hello to a you, you know, at that time he was already a big famous name. And, uh, you know, there was none of that for Matt. He was always very, you know, completely open with everybody. And obviously things have changed. I know everything is online, but, uh, you know, so I've always, you know, held Matt in high regard just for that sense, as well as the writing, but also, you know, that sense of never trying to exclude anyone from doing their job and doing their thing. But the clever, the clever situation, it's the same with television. Television doesn't compete with the press, with the, with the written media. It competes with the online media. And the job between, for us when, when I was out there is that you are trying to beat somebody like David Emmett on Twitter, you know, like you want to. So that meant that you had to change your, your mindset in that you must share. You know, if Gavin Emmett had got a piece of information to do with no relation, by the way, to David Emmett, anybody who doesn't know the, uh, the, the footprint in a MotoGP paddock, but Gavin Emmett, who I work with, was on perhaps Moto3. And he might have a bit of information about somebody in MotoGP. Now, if he, if he kept that to himself and didn't share that with me, or if I didn't share some Moto3 piece of information with him, it would have been half an hour out of sync with everything else that's going on in the world and someone else will have broken that story. So it is a competition. It's a professional competition. But within the paddock, to widen it again, you know, somebody like Pete or, or whoever it might be journalistically, you might share a piece of information with them because they might share a piece of information with you that you can use on television. And it is this relationship in the paddock of, no story can stay secret for, for long. I mean, the Tom Booth Amos thing, as we move full circle to that, you know, the fact that stayed undercover for three years is remarkable. You know, that it is absolutely never in my time have I ever known something as monumentous as that stay undercover for so long. And the only reason was, was because Tom didn't want it to be out there at the time. It was his career he was worried about. It was a friend of his who shot the footage. And so he shut it down. But of course, did he make a mistake in sharing it with, you know, the problem is with any of these things, it's like Chinese whispers, isn't it? He shared some, his friend shared it with another friend, with another friend. And before you know where you are, it, it, it hits Twitter and, and then the fan. And, and we are where we are now and we're all talking about it. But I think actually Tom Booth Amos has probably moved that paddock morality forward further than it's been moved forward for some years. The fact that his, he is now responsible for this massive talking point and the fact that we are now looking to how it can be policed in a proper way so that anybody that's being abused on any level in a paddock can have a place to to discuss that with somebody somewhere it's not happened yet but dawner are going to you know reap the whirlwind they're going to they're going to have to work this out now how that 
uh, person or, or office or position is put into place for anybody who's been abused on any level in the paddock in future. Let us know um, your thoughts on all this as well. We'd love to hear them uh, in the comments or Crash Moto GP as well. But I mean, well, yeah, to come full circle, Pete, you know, it it, it will hopefully uh, if we keep if we apply the pressure. This is applying pressure, isn't it? The media is such a powerful tool that you know uh, people like Matt Ox- Matt Oxley can't you know can't be silenced. The point being is that you know stuff can so easily and has been, as I said earlier, swept under the rug. It happens all over in motorsport. But but this we are talking about it a lot and it's not just one incident it's several different incidents highlighting different levels of um of, of we use that word toxicity of, of the troubles that are going on inherently within the paddock in general as we as you said there should never be a point where communication doesn't take place no matter if you don't like what someone says or you don't like what they're going to report if we're talking about tom booth Ames, there should always be a way to do that shouldn't there and it, because when you shut that down that's when things grow and fester and everything else. Now, just to explain to listeners maybe of how the media stuff works at the track. So you have rider debriefs at the end of each day. So that means a small group of journalists that can be anything from, well, two on, on Thursday in, uh, in Bury Room to, you know, maybe 20 or 30 journalists around a table with the rider asking them questions in a group. Now, Matt is obviously part of that. That's not what he's talking about here. What Matt's talking about is when he requests a one-on-one interview with the rider or with the team member usually about a specific topic. He's great on doing stuff on riding technique and everything else from his own racing career. So that's what he's asking about here is these, the press officers are the gatekeepers, if you like, to the one-on-one stuff or to talking to the team. Um, I was walking into Aragon uh, with a colleague of mine on Sunday morning and and one of the team managers went by on the scooter, a bit of a chat with us and said, come and have a coffee. We went to his hospitality just for a coffee the press officer saw us talking to the team manager and was over like a shot because they thought we were there to try and grill him about, you know, something to do with, with work, if you like. And it wasn't. He'd invite us for a coffee and, you know, you're not going to mess up, uh, ruin someone's morning by, by grilling on that. But that's just an example of where the control lies, at where the relationship is. You shouldn't, in theory, talk to team members without going through the press officer. Now, it depends on each team. It's not that simple. Some teams are much more relaxed about it. Factory teams certainly aren't. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but whatever whatever the situation, it should never be, a, you should never get to a stage where there's, there's established and well-respected members of the media who are un- unable to talk to riders and people in the paddock. I think there's always going to be differences of opinion. You know, they're not going to like what we write sometimes. We're not going to like what they say about us or the, the lack of information they give. But you've always got to have that working relationship. And it's it's a real shame if, as, as it seems from what Matt's saying, that, that it's almost broke down between him and Ducati, the working relationship side of things. It's, it's about the higher management as well. I mean, <laughs> there are levels in this. I mean, again, getting back to the Tom Booth Amos thing, where was the team manager in that situation? You know, there are levels of all the way through all of this, all the way through the paddock, right the way to the factory, back at the manufacturers, wherever that is. Everybody has a level of control over the level below them. Um, so, I mean, the pecking order has, has, has broken down in that situation. In Matt's situation with Ducati, obviously has. The, the fact is that they, you know, in any situation, I mean, in some respects, if you wanted to speak, we'll use Valentino Rossi as, a, as an example. If you wanted to speak with Valentino Rossi on the grid or prior to a race, you had to book that. That was nearly a year in advance to get one or two questions with Valentino Rossi. Um, and that's the kind of power that the PR guys have. Now, rightly or wrongly, I think, I, I mean, I'm, don't please think that I'm, you know, trashing or disrespecting PR people per se, because I'm not. There are some really good PR people that you have a great relationship with in the paddock that, that help you do your job. You know, there's a, Ian Wheeler is a great example for me. Yamaha, you know, superbikes now. Ian Wheeler, great sense of humor, facilitates what you need, what you want. He understands exactly what the situation is from both sides of the fence and he plays the game. It is like a game. You're all doing that dance around trying to get the best out of it. They're trying to get the best out of you, which enhances their position for their factory. You're trying to get the best out of them, which does you the right job as a journalist uh, or, or whatever that might be. So... It just seems strange that, that the hierarchy have not seen this coming. You know, if they're not getting what they want from their PR, 
it's not a good bypass in their PR department and 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 slamming someone like Matt Oxley. It's their PR department that are responsible, in my view. You know, they are the facilitators. They are the the people in the middle that should be making it all happen both ways. You know, you can't get this kind of bad press. You know, the the the, the thing over if we go for it, the Peko Bangnaya thing. You know, the, how this all kicked off. Well, it's, it's a double kick, isn't it? Double kick off, really. We've got the the Rodman helmet that that uh, Matt Oxley railed against, which was you know, Peko Bagnaya is a, a a fan of this particular sports person that that has a, a, a you know terrible record when it comes to whatever he's done in his private life. Um, and then of course there's the drink driving situation that poor old Peko found himself in as well. You know, two things really where he shot himself in both feet simultaneously. Um, it's hard to believe that PR have not actually got a hold of this. You know, Peko, whatever you're doing, just run it by us. It's all it takes. It's really simple. You know, whatever you're going to do next, run it by us. Obviously, drink driving is not the kind of thing that you're going to run by a PR firm. I'm, I'm going to go out and get stoned and then put my car in the ditch. Is that all right? Um, because obviously everybody knows that that is definitely not all right. But the point being is Peko responded even to to the article that, that we did on here um, he, he got kind of cheesed off with the with the the headline that went out on the crash uh, podcast when I said he was an idiot. The first thing I know, he's bloody written to me and and said why why are you why are you being rude to me? And really, that should have gone through his PR. You know, they should have said to him, look, don't respond to any of this stuff that's going out there. You're going to get you know flooded with questions and things. Just keep your head down, daddy daddy. That should have been down to PR. Yeah, you know, they should have calmed the situation. Then it came down to the the Rodman, um, you know, paint job on his helmet for Mizano. You know, it's almost like it's almost like ignorance that they're not going to think that silly old motorcycle followers are are, are going to see this stuff, are going to understand this in a wider context. It's like, you know, motorbike people, motorbike fans, they're not you know dim. <laughs> To put it mildly, you know, there's a lot of very intelligent, very smart, very worldly, global, you know, people that follow MotoGP, and to to have you know a, 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 somebody of the of the character of Rodman stuck on the side of a, a a man who could win the world championship this year's helmet um, would be ill-advised to say the very least. And in the situation that we're in, you know, PR should have been across that. Now they'll say, well, we didn't know what the rider was doing. The first time he walked into the into the, the 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 cabin with the with the helmet showing off the helmet, as we all do as riders, yeah, you know, look at that, it's a great paint job. Yeah, but hang on a minute, who's that on there? You know, these guys should have been across that kind of stuff. Do they not live in the real world? Is is the next question, I suppose. You know, are they not as skillful a people as Ducati should be hiring, perhaps? loads of questions i think uh, i am conscious though that we should probably touch on some of the racing action that occurred <laughs> that occurred last weekend as well we could clearly talk about this till the cows come home quite literally um but it is a fascinating issue one that absolutely should be discussed uh, across the board uh let's hope that the pressure is applied and, and and we see we see some changes from from uh, and, and move forward with morale and and the way uh motor gd paddock is working at the moment um, let's rewind though to a fantastic race uh, once it got underway uh, in Thailand and for the second time this season Miguel Oliveira took victory after getting the better of the man who's taken his ride next year Jack Miller uh, who uh, looked like he nearly had it in hand but Miguel Oliveira managed to snatch it and then hold on to it um, but Keith from the very start, obviously, whether the big talking points, should they have started sooner? Should they have started at all? Lots of riders uh, in disagreements about what the conditions are like. Crutchlow, Rins, Alicia Spargra was chatting to every official going before they got racing. Even Fabio Quattararo wasn't too keen. But uh, clearly, I think it might be better if they hadn't raced for Fabio's sake. But what did you make of it all? Well, Alicia Spargro, I mean, he wears his heart on his sleeve, doesn't he? And he's the old boy now in the paddock and... Uh... We've seen Alesh before when he's kicking and screaming and shouting and, and trying to rally the rally the troops to, to his way of thinking. Um, they got it bang on. If they'd gone any later, we'd have had a thunderstorm. You know, as the race came to an end, the, the, the heavens opened and it absolutely flooded. So we'd have had a, a shortened race if they'd left it another five minutes. 
yeah, conditions are not perfect. There's no doubt about it. There was a lot of water still on the on, but um, I think they got it just right. Um, the Mona GP race got away. Mona two guys, I felt sorry for them. Half points for them. You know, they just they they were unfortunate. They they were part of the major deluge that came down prior to to Mona GP, but. They hit their marks with the Mona GP race at the end of the day. They got it out in a reasonable time. You know, Buriram was alive. It was a massive event as usual. Um, disaster for Quattararo. Um, Bangnaya, he's right on it now, isn't he? It's very interesting. I think Ducati um, needs some decent PR, so it worked out quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Only two, two points, Pete. Two points between it now. Aleish as well. You had to. You had to have felt a little bit sorry for him in, in what seemed to be like a, uh, a a really bad weekend for both the Prettiers. But he was kind of saved by the fact that well, Fabio had such an awful race. But then he also got a long lap penalty. On the other side, Pecco clearly fast, clearly up there. But he wasn't. He wasn't in the fight for the the win, or at least he wasn't. He wasn't showcasing that hand. Maybe airing on the side of caution. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is the weather. I mean, it, to be honest, it was a miracle that MotoGP didn't get a wet session before before the race. I mean, it, it was wet the whole week. It was wet in the morning. It was wet at night. It was pouring. And yet MotoGP avoided all of that. And then suddenly the luck ran, runs out in, in time for the race. So nightmare scenario for everyone because they've got to use a, find a wet setup with no practice time at all, especially if you're Danilo Petrucci and you, <laughs> you've barely ridden the bike and now you've got to ride in the wet with the setting, basically Juan Mir's settings. But uh, but yeah, Banyaya, just to rewind slightly, in the warm-up, he was flying in the dry warm-up. He was looking really confident. And uh, then suddenly, were, you know, nightmare scenario, it rains. Remember a week earlier in, in Japan, he was, what, 12th on the grid in the wet. So, you know, he was pretty worried. And it, he, he actually credited Jack, didn't he? He said Jack sort of could see that, that Banyai was looking a bit nervous there, went over to his side of the box and just said, you know, look, mate, you can do this. You're a good rider. You, you, you know, you were good in the wet last year. Mandalika, the previous wet race, Banyai had been 15th, didn't he? So, I mean, it was all looking like it was all going topsy-turvy for him. Quattarara was on the podium there, so it looked great. And then, as Keith says, the race happens, and he just he got bumped a bit wide by uh, Miller into turn one, squeezed out a bit, and then he just plummeted. And there was, you know, he, he struggled the whole race. So, uh, you know, what was it? Well, we don't know exactly. We, none of us got to speak directly to Quattarara because, as you saw on TV, he walked out of the garage, and that was it. No, You know, he didn't speak to any TV, any media, um, even the team, I think, they just let him cool down because obviously massive blow for him, having just gained those points in Japan and then losing them all in that way and more with Banyaya finishing third. As you say, not a win, but yeah, I mean, two points with three races remaining. I mean, what a... And Aleish, as you say, only 20 points behind. I mean, I, I asked Aleish on the Saturday uh, after qualifying, you know, and, and he'd, he'd had a nightmare weekend in the dry. He, he and Vinales, that harder spec compound rear tyre that they use at Austria... Not wasn't quite as hard as Mandalika, but they use it in Austria. They use it there. Just kept spinning for them. They had no grip. He's thirteenth on the grid. Banyaya's third. Quattararo's fourth. I mean, it looked like, to be honest, title hopes over. And then somehow he comes out of it all five points closer to Quattararo than he'd been going into it. He did say if it would rain, it'd be all or nothing. He was going to take risks. So to be honest, when I saw him going up the inside of Binder, there it wasn't a surprise. You know, he was going to he was going to go for it, and he got to put it in his words a long, long lap penalty. <laughs> Not a Quattararo Silverstone long lap penalty of about a second and a half. It was a bit longer, wasn't it, this weekend? And and so that dropped him back again. But it, but even so, I mean, he said, look, maybe it's a sign. Every time every you know things look like they're over for for relation of Prilia, something happens and he stays in it. Yeah, that long lap is an interesting situation. I'm glad you touched on that because it, it it's kind of like it's a bigger penalty at some tracks than it is at others. And I'm wondering whether that inconsistency is is what we're looking for in our sport nowadays. I mean, bearing in mind that you can get penalised for just touching a bit of green paint nowadays. I'm wondering whether we we should go to a, an additional time situation where if, if you've got a, what is a long lap penalty, it's a three second time penalty and you've got to work from, from there or, or you've got to drop a place or something. I don't know, but the long lap, because of its inconsistency, or is that the fun of it? Is it the fact that, you know, you you don't risk a long lap penalty in Thailand because you are going to get a proper penalty. Um, so does that make it a, 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 a bigger, uh, you know, whatever the word I'm looking for, um, distraction? 
punishment, punishment or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe this is maybe this is because of Silverstone. You know, maybe there was all the complaints at Silverstone, so maybe they have gone. You know, we do need to make sure this is nearer to three seconds than it is. Trouble is, is where you, you can know. put it. The, the problem is, is which corner yes, can you put yeah. a long lap penalty in? Some, you know, you got you can't compromise the safety as much, and it's already, you know, when you think about it, some uh, going around the outside of a track, if someone slides off and, and wipes you out. It's always been something for me that where, where these track designers design pit exits around the outside of a fast corner. You know, Phillip mm. Island is a good example of that, where we're going next. I mean, you've got this pit exit that runs around one of the fastest corners, one of the most hectic corners there are anywhere. Somebody or, or, or a pair of riders slip off and you're you're running out of pit lane in whatever session it might be. You, you're going to get wiped. I, I've always wondered why they, they, they do that. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's just because of the demographics. Oh, sorry, demographics, topography of the of the of the track. So you can't do it any other way than put the pits in that particular position. But I don't know. I mean, I just feel there's a little bit of work to do on long laps, or maybe not. What's What's your view at home? The the other penalty, of course, was for Bezeki, wasn't it, in the lead? Yeah. Uh, you know, he got. Well, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, he obviously felt it was unfair. He did exceed track limits, but you could clearly see he was kind of forced into it, wasn't he? But yeah, but that turn one, opening lap, rah, 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 you know, it's a kind of one of them ones where when you've got all of those guys barreling into that type of corner in those kind of conditions, you know, I, I don't know. I thought, I thought it was a little harsh, to be frank with you. Um, having seen so many get away with it in the past, and so therefore he probably thought he'd get away with it this time. But he did end up, you know, he went off the track and he ended up um, with a bit of an advantage, I think, at the end of the day. So perhaps that's the way they saw it, was that he gained just a little bit too much of an advantage using the uh, car park as part of the track. And of course, the problem is as well, a, a track like Thailand or any other humid country, you know, the humidity was so high, there's no way you're going to dry the track. You know, the sun wasn't out. Uh, it was cloud covered. So... You know, to, to lose time in the early early laps so is important, you know, not to effectively because the track ain't going to dry. There isn't really even going to be a dry line until getting on towards the end of the race. And that's if, it, if another bit of precipitation doesn't touch the tarmac. Um, so it's kind of like you've got all of those things in your head as well and you cannot afford to, to give way too much in turn one. You've got to really be quite forceful. I hate to um, bring up uh, Ducati again. Uh, the PR team would be loving this, though. But uh, obviously, it was a, for, at the start of the weekend. It was in the dry, especially. It was a, pretty good for for Ducati. Uh, and a lot of uh, questions coming in on this as well. And I, I want to ask: Is MotoGP in danger of becoming Ducati GP? Really? This is from Timothy Offer. Hi, guys. Love the podcast. Look forward to it every week. Um, firstly, hi from Cape Town. Secondly. I'm not sure what you think, but I'm not a fan of how Dorna has allowed so many Ducatis on the track. It's absolutely insane. Now, because of Ducati's crazy speed, we have riders who aren't necessarily the most talented, but because they are on a fast bike, they are able to disrupt another rider's race, specifically the championship contenders. I guess this is the nature of the sport, though, but it is getting boring now, as it might as well be a Ducati competition. Will any other team ever be able to win the constructors? It's actually ridiculous and has made part of the sport uninteresting and predictable. Well... Cape Town is a lovely place. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all you had to say. Okay. No, uh, no, I, I don't can comment on this, obviously. <laughs> Have you ever known anything I can't comment on? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, the, uh, I mean, we've talked about this before, eight bikes, eight Ducatis on the grid. It's something that they are propping up the, the, the majority of the grid. There's no doubt about it. So from a manufacturer's point of view, they have got quite an, off, uh, an advantage in, in many ways because you've got eight bites of the cherry. Um, not to mention the extra data you're getting back from all of the bikes, even though they're not all the same, obviously. But you've got a situation where you've, you've got all your bases covered with Ducati. Now, it's not Ducati's fault. You know, they're doing what they've been allowed to do. So that's that. And from a sports point of view, you know, you've only got to look at the time sheets. You know, when you've got most of the bikes within a second, you know, you've got to argue whether they're, 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 they've got that much of a, an advantage. Yeah, there is a bit of a front. You know, now they've got the thing to turn mid-corner. Um, Ducati have really got a motorbike that works in most conditions and at most racetracks, whereas they haven't had for God knows how long. You know, do they have an advantage this year? Yes, they probably do. They've had an advantage in, in various parts of the, the world and various tracks of the world in the past, but they haven't put a whole track together, if you like. It's always had trouble turning or whatever it might be. And that's just the, the way the evolution of 
of each particular mark for me. I mean, that's the excitement of it. I think because of aero and because of ride height adjustments and so on and so forth, it's made it harder to pass. You know, to pinch an inch into a corner nowadays is virtually impossible. It's, 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 a, it's never been as hard to make a pass as it is now. You know, it's very, very difficult. So Ducati with a little bit of horsepower advantage, you know, where they can just sort of get up the inside of the, of the, of the next man and mire their trajectory into a corner it is an advantage for Ducati at the moment. How can you fix that? <sighs> Impossible, really. Um, should they take away Ducati's advantage? No, I don't think so, because then the, the grid would not aspire to what Ducati are achieving. It is a prototype series. It is the number one series. It's like Formula One. You know, okay, Formula One have, have got two by two, so that we don't have that. But you will find that Formula One cars have an advantage. There's a big Ferrari going on at the moment, whether somebody's exceeded the spending cap on on whether Red Bull have cheated by by, you know, spending too much money effectively on on performance, whatever it is, areas that aren't allowed to. You know, there are always going to be areas of rules that that somebody somewhere a manufacturer or another are going to find you know to their advantage and that's that's what it's all about really when you're talking about prototype the very you know pinnacle of of our particular sports um i i i i feel a bit sorry for ducati getting the stick they get the manufacturer's trophy again it's yeah i can understand where mr cape town is is getting on top of that because there are eight of them in the with a chance of, of scoring significant points for the manufacturer's trophy. Um, the passing, um, the, the where he says it's boring, well, uh, I, I beg to differ a little bit on that, if you understand the way of motorbike racing. Um, again, I mean, it's funny, we can make that analogy with Formula One, can't we? Formula One is, is probably, if you look at it for passing manoeuvres and so on and so forth, one of the most boring sports there is out there at the moment within motorsport, but it is still the pinnacle. We still all watch it. Yeah, I, I watch it because it's enthralling. It's the, it's the enthralling part of it. It's, the, it's how is it being done is the bit that does it for me. And, and the same thing in bike racing now to an extent is that you, you're just looking for those little nuances. I mean, it, yeah, it's not like touring cars you know, versus Formula One. Touring car, everybody bashing into everybody else. Everybody, you can't tell who's going to win because they're all, all over everywhere. But what's the best sport, touring car or Formula One? For me, it's still Formula One. You know, can we make an analogy between British Superbikes and MotoGP? At the moment, British Superbikes, I am watching from behind my settee. I cannot sit on the chair and watch it. It is just the scariest thing I'm watching. It is incredible at this moment in time. I've never seen anything quite like it. I mean, those guys are throwing it at the scenery. You know, it's just, it's scary to watch. But still, it is MotoGP that's the number one motorbike sport. I'll keep it brief, Harry. It's a free market, isn't it? The bottom line is that Ducati are offering the best package and the satellite teams are choosing the Ducati. Yes, in a perfect world, we'd all like one factory team, one satellite team, although we'll only have five manufacturers next year. So if we did that, there'd only be 20 bikes on the grid. So you're still going to end up with with, a, with one or two manufacturers having a third team. So the, the point is, what's the alternative? The alternative is that they, you force the satellite teams to have a less competitive bike just to keep the numbers even. Well, you know, that, that's not really fair on them. So the, the answer is that the other, t the other manufacturers need to come up with competitive satellite packages so that the, the satellite teams move to them. I mean, and, and that's, you know, yeah. And the, and the cost of them is another thing. Yeah, Ducati, it's a competitively priced uh, package. And it's competitive on track. You can you can be Marco Bezecchi and finish on the podium as a rookie uh, and things like that. I mean, so the satellite teams they just want the best results, and if they can afford it, they'll go for the best bike that they could, that's within their budget. And, and it's as simple as that. It doesn't matter what the name is. Well, absolutely. But you know how we um, we we put our title predictions in last time around. No one put Peco. <laughs> none of us and only 
Can, can we do it? No, again? <laughs> no. But I tell I tell you why I bring this up because uh, Colm has got in touch to give his title predictions. Uh, he's gone for um, Keith Hewin for the win with Kevin Schwantz's lucky strike RGV five hundred. Pete McLaren in P two with Randy Mamola's haircut, <laughs> and Harry gets disqualified because he likes F one cars. Lock it in. <laughs> so I think that was a pretty nice one. And in fact, it was only Keith who picked up one point for his podium prediction last time uh, with Miller uh, on the podium too. Uh, interesting, actually, just uh, uh, we'll, we'll, ha- we'll run a little bit over, but Miller um, talking recently, uh, clearly in good form, clearly loves mixed conditions and when it's a, you know, a, lot, a bit of an action race. Uh, but he's come out recently saying... Um, it felt felt very on the outside uh, while in that Ducati team. Part of his reason for leaving, you know, obviously I think he stressed that he got on well with them and they were a great team. But, you know, the fact he wasn't Italian and, and couldn't speak the language naturally, um, he felt a, a little bit isolated. So do you think now that he's sort of got his, his future confirmed that that's sort of maybe a reason behind this, this great sort of spike in form? I mean, we know he can do it, but he's on a bit of a run at the moment. Well, you're telling me he can speak German or Austrian more than he can speak Italian. <laughs> yeah, well, <you laughs> KTM, know. he's going to have the same problem when he goes there as he had, <laughs> he had in Italy. Um, I, I think Jack Miller is a wonderful guy. When we see him next time, he's going to be a married man as well. So congratulations, Jack Miller. He is. I think Bang Nair is going to miss the likes of Jack Miller. You talked about it earlier on. I mean, it, there's a certain pastoral care that Jack has. He's the big bloke in the paddock, isn't he? He's the He's the proper dude. The real deal. He can ride a motorbike. He's a good guy to be around. He's he's got a little bit of an eye on on his teammate for for this championship as well. You know, I, I rate Jack Miller so highly, and I think he'll be a big loss to Ducati in the circumstances. I think, um, you know, who would you like to go out with di- to dinner with out of the paddock? Well, Jack Miller would be on the list, wouldn't he, straight away? And uh, who would you like as a teammate if you were racing? You know, it would be Jack Miller. I think Jack Miller. You know, to KTM, they've they've scored a big hit with Jack Miller. And if they, you find a team that's sort of not really, you know, made a step yet, is likely to be the team that makes quite a big one come next year when you think of the amount of effort that KTM put behind things. So I think Miller might have made a move that will suit him, will suit the team. You know, Bastianini and Pecco Bagnaia, I think that's going to be um, slightly more inflamed, shall we say. Fireworks. <laughs> That would be a fun one to watch. Uh, I was talking exactly about this, that, about Jack uh, with someone in the in the paddock on the weekend and, and just, you know, like you're doing that, putting aside the results, Jack, the team player, and they were saying, look, you know, Ducati are going to miss that. You know, Jack's not a guy who just sits in his corner with his crew doing his, you know, just all about him. He's a guy who will pull the team together at difficult times and work with all sides of the garages and not a lot of riders will do that. And they were saying, you know, that Ducati are going to miss that. Apart from everything else that Jack brings, just that team player, that stepping up, being a leader. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, at KTM with Brad Binder, I mean, that'll be a great pairing, won't it? I mean, you know, Brad, a very likable team player guy as well. So you put those two together, KTM have got, you know, there should be a fantastic atmosphere in that team. And it does matter, that kind of thing. I mean, at the weekend, having Cal... OK, Cal's been back for a few races. Petrucci back. I mean, the, the whole the looks on the faces of the Suzuki team of just having this guy who came in, uh, you know, it is just so happy to be there and he's enthusiastic. And I mean, they've been through a terrible year, the Suzuki team, haven't they? Um, And also Petrucci one year ago when he left MotoGP, he was down, wasn't he? He'd had that horrible year on the, on the Tektuar KTM and banging his head against the brick wall. Wanted just wanted to go out and race the Dakar, didn't he? For goodness sake, here he was coming back, it was like a present for him. And, it, and you could see it lifts the whole team. It does those kind of details, isn't it? At this level, everyone can ride a bike quick. It's all those other details that you can put together. And I think Jack is one of those guys. There are other, others, as I say, Brad Bindi, you hear about. It's one of the things you always ask about, isn't it? With, to PR people or anything else. You know, what's so-and-so like? You know, What are they like when the garage door goes down? And uh, you know, when you hear things like that about Jack, that, yeah, he will pull the whole team together, You know, both sides of the garage. He's a, he's a real asset, I think, for any team. And you know what? If you look a bit broader, it's parental. I think that the the, the Miller uh, family, if you like, when mum and dad are over, you know, you can go and have a drink with them in the bar and they're proper down to earth, proper tough people. Same with the Binders. You know, you've got the Binder family when they were over. You know, it, it's. I think that that kind of parental influence is there. I think that, that probably moulded the 
the boy in the first place, which is uh, an interesting dynamic. There's, there's one for you and Mr. Oxley there somewhere, the, uh, the piece on the families, I feel. <laughs> That's or, if he doesn't piss off their PR in the first place. And that, and that. How's the Keith Ewan column coming? Would you get any scoops in that? <laughs> some, some people keep trying to get me to write a book. And, oh, uh, yes. I, yeah, the, the problem with that is, is that, that I'm not that wealthy. And I, I, I when it comes to relatively um, uh, protecting myself against being sued. <laughs> <laughs> and what would be the, I've always thought, what's the point of having a book out there if you can't dish a little bit of dirt? You know, if you if you can't actually name True. names and yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, and use the stuff that you really know, I mean, it just seems a pointless exercise to me. I mean, yeah, Maybe I you should write some myself. fiction based on truth. <laughs> well, actually, I was thinking about that. Um, there, there was a couple of books I got in my head, but again, I don't know whether it would. Uh, I mean, my family's quite young, so uh, they can probably do without their dad embarrassing them. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late for that, Keith. Yeah, so um, I was going to say, thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> I'll turn them up, you knock them down. Uh, <laughs> right, look, um, two points is the gap in MotoGP. Fabio Quattararo, 219. Peko, 217. Aleish, just 20 points, 199. Miller, and there, Bastinini, still in it, 180, 179 points apiece. Um, this is going to be a brilliant last few rounds. We've actually got a bit of a week off, which is which is nice, I think. I think we all need a bit of a breather after the uh, on-track and off-track action. Um, let's round things off for this show with the Moto2 and Moto3 action. Let's just touch on that. Um, and Pete, well, in Moto2, Tony Arbolino uh, led the way when the red flag came out, as, as Keith already alluded to. We had to, to cut Moto2 short because the rain just poured down uh, during uh, the race. Uh, but it was heartbreak, really, wasn't it, for, for home hero uh, Somcat Chantra, who had made history as the first Thai rider to take pole, but he was sort of thrown out the race quite literally by the, the sheer amount of water mm. down on that track. Philip Salak took a second for his first ever podium and Aaron Cadet took third, uh, but as we say, only half points awarded at the end of the day. I think it was only eight, eight laps completed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so rain on the grid. Dry, we had a dry motor three race, rain on the grid, so it was shortened to two thirds distance, 16 laps. But then it just got so atrocious that after eight laps, the red flags were, were thrown. Bit of, the plan was to do a restart, but it, it was just impossible. And uh, I mean, I felt sorry for the photographers that were with me. I had, I had Cormac from HRC, uh, Rob Gray from KTM, uh, Junior, the Czech photographer. They were rushing out, getting soaked, coming back in, going back out for restarts that never happened, getting soaked again, coming back in. It didn't rain in the media room, I'll be honest, but uh, uh, I was okay. But yeah, it, it was just one of those races that you didn't know what it was going to do. You, feeling sorry for t photographers. Hang on a second. <laughs> photographers, <laughs> they don't. They have a little corner in most media places because they're, they're not allowed to be in the main, you know, they keep the photographers over there. They are the, the kind of, you talk about being oppressed as, a, as a, an online journalist. Well, you imagine being a photographer. They are the most oppressed. And uh, and then getting soaking. Mind you, it would have given Goldman an opportunity to wear his rubber suit, I suppose. That's um... <laughs> <laughs> David Goldman, if you're listening. <laughs> but I mean, Tom Kiat Chantra. I mean, obviously having a fairly large Thai connection uh, in our family. That um, getting the pole position, first ever Thai to be on a pole position. You know, there would have been nothing better than to see that big smiling face in in Park Ferme as a as a as a Grand Prix winner. Um, the problem is. Leading the race in those kind of conditions um, is one of the situations is how fast do you go? You know, you're pushing your luck just by being there. So a real, real shame. There's a massive groan early morning here. Um, I can tell you that for nothing. I <laughs> bet. I bet. And now the annoying thing is we've got half decimal, well, half points and decimal decimal <laughs> places in, yes. uh, in the bloody championship. <laughs> One and a half points uh, splits Augusto Fernandez, 238.5. Uh, Iagura, 237. Aaron Canet, 185. Vietti, 165. That is how the Moto2 standing is lining yeah, up. Yeah, but at least we're not going back on count back now, though. Now they've got that no. half point in there. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Um, Moto3 then. Uh, Dennis Foscher kept uh, slim 
title hopes alive uh, to win uh, the Tiger Grand Prix in Moto3 after starting from pole. Uh, Ayumi Suzaki kept him honest, uh, but finished behind with Ricardo Rossi in third. Championship leader, Izen Guevara, uh, damage limitation, really. But a bit of news breaking this morning. Guevara confirmed to be moving up to Moto2 in 2023 with the uh, Gas Gas Aspar team. So 49 points clear and a promotion in the books already for Guevara. So I don't think he'll be too disappointed with uh, his fifth place. No, I think 49 point lead with three rounds to go, 75 points on the table. You know, it's got to be a disaster for the final three lap, three races. I mean, I, there won't be anybody in the paddock that isn't looking forward to going to Phillip Island. Fingers crossed quite often that it's not Arctic conditions down there or whatever that is down at that part of the world. Well, well, Keith, I, I had a text message off Hervé Poncherol this morning saying the weather's not looking good for Phillip Island. So I think we could have some... I mean, it's awful. It depends on which way the wind's blowing. If it's blowing off the sea, you're going to freeze to death almost immediately. If it's blowing off the land, then obviously it's a little warmer. And it can change. You can you can have a... You know, I, I always remember, I think it was Crutchlow who was leading. And we got that bloody asymmetric tyre on the front and all the rest of it that had the hard bit on one side and the soft bit on the other side. And all of a sudden it went, it went like incredibly cold with half an hour still to go in this race and, and, and suddenly tires didn't work because the track suddenly went so cold so quick um if you've got consistent conditions cold or or, or 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 sunny that's great but when they change quite as dramatically as they do in a place like that even with the fantastic racetrack that it is it makes it very very difficult indeed um and we ain't been there for a while and in those kind of places you know track conditions change massively in in in, in a year let alone in three of them um, so we're, we're going to we're going to have a quite a, a fight on our hands here at uh, the Phillip Island. It's going to be very difficult to predict, that is for sure. But mm, tyres well, are going to come into it. Mm. Go on, Pete. And Guevara can win the title, can he? So we could have the first of the champions could be wrapped up at Phillip Island, as you say, Keith. So there'll only be fifty points left after Phillip Island. What's he on forty nine now? So basically, keep it simple. If he wins, he's champion. Yeah. So he'd be the the first champion of, of this year. Nightmare for his teammate Garcia again. You know didn't even get into qualifying two and then take it out on the first lap. I think Adrian Fernandez has got a, a double long lap penalty for Philip Island for that incident. Uh, it wasn't the first time he's, he's, he's sort of tangled with another rider. So yeah, that that's, it's looking difficult now for Garcia, as you say, and Foggia, Foggia, I mean, <laughs> mathematically it's still possible. I mean, what a comeback if he can, uh, if he could get on terms here, but yeah, 49 points. It's it's a big ask. Well, I was going to say, it's a, it's a decent battle in shaping up for the vice champion, second place. So, if Roger, yeah. um getting getting the better of Garcia, if we look at if we look at that, it's a bit close. He's just moved up to second in the standings. So, you know, the title hang might on, well be on, decided in Phillip Island. It, it's only PR men that are interested in vice champions. It's got nothing I'll, to do I'm just trying to make it interesting. <laughs> you could be a PR man one day, Harry. <laughs> well, if it, if it all goes if it all goes uh, south, uh, I'll uh, I'll ask Matt Oxley for some advice. Um, <laughs> let's um, let's leave it there. I think we're not going to do predictions because we've got a we got a weekend off, uh, and then we're back for as uh, we said Philip Island, and then well, only yeah, not long left. It's rapidly running out of time, but championships uh, to be decided, as we say, the first of which could be uh, in Moto Three and in Philip Island next time around. In the meantime, though, make sure you do stay tuned across Crash.net for all the latest news and analysis across the week. And then we'll be back with you next week. Get your questions in, as always. Leave them in the comments section. Tweet, Instagram or Facebook us. Just search Crash Moto GP. And please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts as well. And we shall see you right back here next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>